let's, uh, let's go through the SVM problem and the KQT conditions for the SVM problem. And if we have enough time at the end, I'll do the KQT conditions for L1 penalized problems as well, because those are two cases in which they're pretty revealing as to what they tell us. Um, recall the SVM problem. You've seen it a bunch of times. We derived its dual in the last lecture. Uh, we're going to now inspect the KQT conditions for this problem. Okay, so first off, let's just uh, pause before and say that this is a convex problem. It has all affine uh, inequalities and equalities, and therefore strong duality must hold. Okay, so because strong duality holds, the KQT conditions are not necessary and sufficient for optimality. So once we write them down, if we were to be able to find, um, in this case, beta beta naught and psi, which are my primal variables, and I think I call the dual variables w and v here, that satisfy those conditions, then we know we'd have the solution. And vice versa. We know that any solution also must satisfy those conditions. So um, the KQT condition, uh, the first thing we do, right, when we look at the KQT conditions, is say the stationarity condition, and uh, that's we get that by taking the subgradient with respect to um, a bunch of different primal blocks of variables and set that equal to zero. I'm just going to break up the, the, the gradient, excuse me, with respect to primal variables separately because it's, it's helpful in this case. Right here I have um, all convex functions, so subgradients are just gradients. And what does it look like with respect to beta? Let's just take all the terms that involve beta. I have this from the criterion. And I have, um, I don't remember what direction I wrote it, wrote it as, but let's just guess one. And we'll figure it out if we were wrong. This looks like, um, let's try wi times OK, so that's what I've done is I've taken the Lagrangian, and I've only taken the terms that uh, involve beta. And I've taken a, a gradient with respect to beta. I set it equal to 0 to get the stationarity condition for the beta block. OK, so I, I have other terms in the criterion. For example, this, this term from the slack variables. And I have other terms that come from the constraints, but I have not, I've ignored them for the purpose of this gradient. And that reduces to. Um, the following, I just get beta. Um, in fact, I could have also ignored this, but I guess it was clear to write that. Beta minus um, w times uh, minus the sum of w i times y i times x i equals 0. OK, I just get that from taking the gradient of each of these terms. Or in other words, beta is equal to wi times yi times xi. That's actually a very important equation. Let's hold off on interpreting that, but we'll come back to it. Gives us an expression for our primal variable, which is the, usually the one of interest, beta. And let's do the same thing for beta naught. And the only terms that involve beta naught are um, terms that come from this part of the constraints. And that tells me that uh, just the sum of wi, yi must be equal to 0. All right, taking the derivative here with respect to beta naught. Actually, this is just a derivative because beta naught is just a scalar, scalar variable. And uh, let's look at psi. So the, the derivative with respect to uh, the gradient with respect to psi of, of the Lagrangian. So now we have to keep in this term. And we have um, this term, sum of say vi times psi i, comes from this inequality constraint. 
right, dual variables vi, which we haven't used yet, and this term as well. I guess I'll just write this in for clarity, although th these terms don't matter here. Just see, remember where it comes from. Okay, so that's the, the gradient with respect to psi of the Lagrangian equal to zero. And what do we get out of it? Um, I think it's maybe helpful to write this as in matrix form first. So I'm just going to introduce the ones. This is the vector of all ones. I'm going to write this in, in vector form, rather, before I take the um, Alright, V transpose psi. And this is, I can write as, um, let's just forget about these terms. W transpose the ones vector minus psi. Okay, and so if I take the gradient with respect to psi, I just get C times the ones vector minus V plus or minus w equals 0. And I, I just will write that as w equals c times the ones vector minus v. OK, so these are the stationarity conditions. Basically, what I come away with are, from the stationarity conditions are these sets of relationships. OK, starting to look familiar with what we concluded with duality, actually. Of course, the calculations here are going to be naturally very similar, given that the fact that the KKD conditions and duality basically use the same flow of arguments. OK, that was stationarity. So all this was just stationarity. How about complementary slackness? So let's do the complementary slackness condition now. Um, complementary slackness is telling us that if we look at the dual variable times each of these constraint functions, that they multiply, those have to be 0. So that tells us that for all i, we must have vi times psi i being equal to 0. And for all i, we must have wi times <coughs> the constraint it multiplies being 0. And I'm gonna. I'm not gonna write down primal and dual feasibility because they're. I mean, they just. Are, they are what they are. They're right here. Okay. So there's these two, and then there's also the fact. I guess I'll just write down the dual feasibility. So primal feasibility. You know. You know what that is. And dual feasibility. Just to remind you, right? We have to have v and w both being non-negative in every component. Okay, so those are the KKT conditions, and actually, we can nicely summarize them just with, um, say, these two lines here plus dual feasibility. And let's kind of learn a few things from them. Let's inspect them a bit. So, at optimality, what we've shown this is the first block of the K of the stationarity condition, is that beta, the primal solution that determines the hyperplane, right? That determines, and this determines that determines the hyperplane here, right? xi transpose beta that we're going to use to um, the direction of the hyperplane we're going to use to classify our points. We've written it as the sum of yi times wi times xi. Okay, where wi was our dual variable. That's actually a relationship that probably if you learn SVMs you're very familiar with. I can always write um, the primal variable as a sum of as a linear combination of my dual variables. Wi times y times xi. And what's very special about that Wi is non-zero if and only if, actually not if and only if, let's just say only if uh, this, it's only if we have an equality here between this, this, the slack amount 1 minus psi i we're allowing and the kind of the gap in the classification at this point. Right? From the complementary slackness condition, if this was ever non-zero, so if we had a strict equality here, this was strictly bigger than 
yi times xi transpose beta plus beta naught. Then we must have wi equals 0. Right? That's what this tells us. So the set of uh, points at which I have an equality here, which means that wi is not necessarily 0, I'll call the support points of my support vector machine. And we can see that they're the only ones that matter for determining the primal solution. So the primal solution is only actually a sum of a small number of dual components. And those correspond to support points, ones that um, kind of pictorially support the hyperplane. The ones that are, are stri cl classified strictly well, so bigger than the amount of slack allowed, don't contribute anything to constructing the primal solution, because wi is 0. And so if I look back at this relationship here, Right. They, don't, they don't have any effect on that sum. So both computationally and also kind of statistically, that's an interesting fact. Let's actually look at this a little more carefully. Let's just look at the support points. And let's think about um, <clears throat> two cases for the support points. So support points, remember, as for this equation, are points for which we have an equality here. These are the i's for which we have an equality here. So if I have an equality here, and psi i itself is 0, then um, you could interpret that as xi is lying on the edge of the margin. Okay, And if we look at uh, the constraint on, on w, so if we look back at this condition, then this actually implies that w must be between uh, 0 and, well, we already know it's bigger than or equal to 0 from dual feasibility. And this implies that w must be less than or equal to c in each component, because v is non-negative. We also had this, by the way, when we drive the, the dual, this kind of constraint. And so for support points that have the property that psi i is 0, then w can't be 0. So by process of elimination, it could be anything in between 0 and c. That's all we know. Okay? For support points that have the property that psi i is non-zero, and they actually lie on the wrong side of the margin, those points. They get classified on the wrong side of the margin. And we actually can conclude that wi must be equal to c for those points. How? Um, we can go back to, uh, to this equation, which is complementary slackness for the psi constraint. And we say that if, if, um, if psi i is non-zero, that means that vi must be equal to 0 right, by complementary slackness. And by looking back at the relationship between v and w, that implies that we must have w i equal to c, that i, because v i is 0. Okay, so again, just using the, the conditions in combination. Yeah? Um, if c i is 0, why does that mean w i has to be non 0? w i is, these are, this is only for support points. So this is just for the points for which we have an equality between 1 minus psi i and, and uh, yi times xi transpose beta plus right. beta naught. So wi is not 0 only if that happens. Right. Why, why does that uh, go the other way? It's, I'm not saying it does. So th these, these two conditions only apply to support points. So these are already points for which w is non-zero. Okay. Because I, I'm assuming that they have an equality in this constraint. OK, you're right. So let me, let me uh, switch the order of that red line. Wi is meant to say that the points for which Wi is non-zero are called support points, because they support the primal solution in, in this construction. Okay. So that, maybe that was just confusing where that, that appeared. So I'll switch that in the slides. OK, so. Um, Here's a, a, like a picture of this. Um, okay, so for example, um, this is such a point. Uh, this, is, this is one of the support points right here. Okay, this psi 5 is 0.5 is one of the support points. It lies on the wrong side of the margin. We can conclude from the KKD conditions that 
w5 must be c for this point. Okay? Um, and the same can be concluded about, say, w3 for the same reason. We can't conclude what the values of um, psi1, sorry, what w1 or w2 or w3 are, because these are support points that lie on the proper side of the margin. We just know that it's anywhere between 0 and c. And for all of these other points, okay, where we have a strict inequality here, wherever I wrote it, here, we have wi equals 0. And so we actually know the dual solution at all of these points, all of these points outside the margin. It's the way we would interpret the KKD conditions for, this, for the SVM problem. Yeah? Psi i is not equal to 0. Is x i necessarily a support point? Um, e, I, I, I suppose, right? Because if psi i was not equal to 0, that means that v must be um, 0 from complementary slackness. And then we look at the <coughs> stationarity condition that we got out of the side block, and we determined that w is equal to c in that component. So it's the support point. OK, so this, this is like a very common thing. People study SVMs. They, they have all these things. And I think that they, they maybe seem a bit mysterious where they come from until you just realize that it's a very um, routine derivation from the KKT conditions. I'm not saying that these are trivial conclusions. They're actually very non-trivial. But they're not super mysterious. They just come from the KKT conditions. Um, so they don't, this doesn't really give us a way of finding the solution, but it gives us a better understanding about the properties of the solution like we just described here. Right? It gives us this nice geometric understanding. And in fact, we can actually use what we've learned from the KKT conditions to screen away points that we know are going to be non-support points before we perform the optimization. So if n is like you know, a huge number, like a million or something, or a billion, then uh, I can actually screen with some uh, kind of further analysis of the KKD conditions, I can find points that I know are not going to be support points. We're going to have the property that wi is going to be 0 at the solution. And so I can actually safely throw those out of my problem, because I know that the primal solution wouldn't depend on those anyways. Right? And that's a, an advanced topic. It's one of the um, advancements in screening rules that people have developed in the last couple of years. And if there's interest, we may cover that stuff at the end of class. Any questions about SVM? OK, um, let's, let's go through constrained and Lagrange forms of, uh, <clears throat> I guess, convex problems. Did I not say it's convex here? Yeah, I, I don't. I didn't explicitly say f was con x, f and h were convex here, but I'm thinking about convex problems. And uh, oftentimes in, say, like a machine learning paper, you'll see something that says that, well, I have this problem that I'm, I'm interested in solving, minimize overall x, f of x subject to h of x is less than or equal to t. And t is um, some tuning parameter. And oh, that's equivalent to minimizing f of x plus lambda times h of x, where, where lambda is some other tuning parameter. OK, we often switch back and forth forth between those shamelessly without worrying about um, you know, whether people believe us or are going to question us. And uh, you would have seen this a lot, I think, if you've read some ML or stats papers. And so we're going to actually show that this is true under pretty broad conditions from the KKT conditions. It's just a very natural application of the KKT conditions. I guess I wrote it here, assuming f and, and h are convex. So let's go from uh, this problem c to this problem l, constrained problem to the look I'll call this the Lagrange problem. You want us to call this a, a penalized problem. Um, if problem C is strictly feasible, so if there's a strictly feasible point here, then because it's a convex problem, we know from Slater's condition that strong duality is going to hold. Okay, And that means that um, the KKT conditions are necessary. So. It means that I mu there must exist some lambda. This is the uh, multiplier for this constraint, h of x less than or equal to t, that I form as part of the KKT conditions, such that uh, any solution x star 
in this problem minimizes the Lagrangian. That's the stationarity condition of the KQT conditions, right? And if x, if x minimizes the Lagrangian, which is f of x plus lambda times, right, this is h, this is thinking of the constraint as h of x minus t less than or equal to 0, then because t is a constant with respect to this minimization problem, it, I'm just saying that x has to minimize f of x plus lambda times h of x, which was the penalized problem that I was interested in, in studying. OK, so in other words, if I have a strictly feasible point in this constraint set, then there is a lambda such that x solves the Lagrangian problem at that lambda, just using the stationarity condition and the KQT conditions. OK, so that, was, that side was pretty easy. The other side is actually even easier. Um, if x star is a solution in the Lagrange problem, and I'm just going to define t to be h of x star, so it's the value of the constraint achieved by x star, then maybe even on first principles, without even knowing the KQT conditions, you would say that um, x star would also solve this problem, right, with t being equal to the value achieved by, by h of x star. But we can also just say, well, the KQT conditions are, are formally verified by that problem. Um, Right, what are the KQT conditions for the constrained problem? They are stationarity, but stationarity holds because x star was a solution for the Lagrange problem. Because again, these two are essentially the same thing, these two, two problems. And the other conditions are complementary slackness. Well, complementary slackness holds by construction because here I've taken uh, t to be equal to h of x star, so the difference in that constraint is 0. And we have primal and dual feasibility. OK, so the other direction is, is also very straightforward. So what have we shown? We showed that solutions in the Lagrange problem over all parameters lambda are always solutions in the constrained problem. So if you give me any, any Lagrange form problem with any parameter lambda, I can always find a constrained problem that admits the same solution. And in fact, the value of t here is explicit. I just take t to be the achieved h of x star. That's the, that's the bound I put in my constraint problem. The other direction was not quite as strong, but it was still a pretty general statement, which is that if I have any solutions to the constraint problem, and I look at t such that the constraint set is strictly feasible, that was my only restriction, right? This constraint set had to be strictly feasible. Then I could find a lambda that made it true that um, that x was a solution in the Lagrange problem. Now, this value of lambda is not explicitly derived from t. So this, it's actually, it would be very hard to find the value of lambda that made that equivalence true. But there is some lambda for which it's true. OK, so it's nearly a perfect equivalence. It's not a perfect equivalence because um, there could be right, some t's that have the property that there are no lambdas that give us the solution at that t. And those are t's that make the constraint set not strictly feasible. We just can't say anything about those those uh, tuning parameter values. But um, here's a convention we typically take. Let's suppose that um, the only value of t that leads to a feasible set that's not strictly feasible is 0. Let's suppose, suppose that, uh, for example, if h was a norm, then the only time you could give me a t that had a, uh, a feasible set that wasn't strictly feasible would be t equals 0. Then I just say that the solution at t equals 0 corresponds to the solution in the Lagrange problem at lambda equals infinity. That's the convention we take. Okay, So for those problems, we do have actually the perfect equivalence. We just remember that we can take lambda infinite as a tuning parameter choice. Um, OK, so, so that's the equivalence between Lagrange and constrained problems. Questions about that? OK, um, so we have enough time to cover this last result, which um, is another application of the KQT conditions. And it's a, I think it's a fairly surprising result about the uniqueness of solutions in L1 penalized problems. And hopefully we can go through all of, all of the proof. It's not super complicated. So let's consider the following result. 
if, um, if f is a differentiable and strictly convex function, and x is any matrix, n by p matrix, and we consider this problem, minimize f of x beta plus lambda times the L1 norm of beta, then if x satisfies something called general position, um, and one condition for that is that if I think of the measurements in x as random, and they're drawn from just some continuous distribution, so I observe the entries at random from some continuous distribution, then with probability 1, there's a unique solution in this problem, and it has at most min np non-zero components. So this is, I think, interesting for a few reasons. The first is that there's no restrictions here on the sizes of p and n. So what happens is you just approach this problem from first principles based on what you know about convexity. And I told you that p was bigger than n. What, what, what do we know about that problem in terms of, uh, say, the uniqueness of its solution? We can't conclude anything, right? We, if p was bigger than n, then um, x is going to be rank deficient, column rank deficient. So I could see this in a few ways. For example, if I took the Hessian of this, the Hessian of this criterion is going to be um, x times, or yeah, x transpose. That's the Hessian of the smooth part of the criterion. And uh, this is not going to be strictly positive definite. Right, this is a p by p matrix, but x was, was only uh, n by p. So this is going to be clearly um, d rank deficient. So the Hessian is not strictly positive definite. You could have also seen just directly that if x has a non-trivial null space, right? if I have some x times, let's call it direction gamma, um, which I can make equal to 0 and gamma is not 0, then I can clearly uh, take a linear combination, a convex combination of gamma and some other point beta, and I could, I could make the uh, f of x beta constant on that line. So it's, it clearly can't satisfy the strict, um, the strict inequality we require for strict convexity. So when x is n by p, p is bigger than n, that's not a strictly convex criterion. Convex analysis kind of basics do not tell us that we have a unique solution. Okay, think of like the lasso problem or logistic regression where I have millions of features but only thousands of, of observations. We don't know the solution is unique. But what this is telling us is that actually, as long as x is not pathological, if I observe random measurements, then it's unique with probability 1. Which is kind of a surprising result. Okay, so it may, may surprise somebody who just knows convex analysis and didn't study um, these problems like from a more statistical perspective. OK, the only requirement we have here is that f itself be a strictly convex function. That says nothing about f of x beta. Right? So an example is, take f, I'll call its argument u, to be y minus u squared. So that's definitely a strictly convex function. But the loss is f at x beta. which is not strictly convex in beta. Okay, so we're just requiring that the, the form of the loss be a strictly convex function, not, not a strong assumption. Okay, let's prove that this from the KKT conditions. I think we can get through most of it in the last several minutes. So what are the KKT conditions for this problem? Um, because it has no constraints, it's in fact, it's really just subgraded optimality. So I guess I could have put this in a previous lecture, but I think it's nice to see now. Um, so all we're doing is we're taking the stationarity condition because we have no constraints. And that's what this is down here. So I've taken the gradient of this term with respect to beta and the subgradient here with respect to beta, and I've set it equal to 0. And I arrived at the conclusion that minus x transpose the gradient at, f of e, at, f, at x beta of f is equal to lambda times s, where s is the subgradient of the L1 norm. That's just gotten right from the stationarity condition. Okay, and this was just the chain rule. And remember, subgradients of the L1 norm are points uh, that have the property that in the ith component, if beta i is non-zero, I have to get the sine of beta i, and otherwise anything between minus 1 and 1. So these, these are the um, KKD conditions. They're just stationarity for this problem. And uh, the first thing to do, maybe I'll leave this as 
an exercise or just something that we can clarify next time in case this wasn't clear. I claim that x beta and s are always unique. Okay, even if beta is un not unique, x beta is always unique. And the way to see that is that exactly um, from the assumption that f was a strictly convex function. So in other words, the fitted value in the Lasso problem is always unique, even though the solution itself may not be unique. And because x beta is unique, s, the optimal subgradient, is also unique. So let me just assert that, and either it will be an exercise or we can come back to it. Um, given that, I can uniquely define a set, which is a set of all j, that have the property that inequality is achieved here with s being equal to 1 in, in absolute value. So it's, it's the variables that have maximal correlation with the gradient in absolute value. This is saying something like the, my variables have correlation with the, with the negative gradient that is somewhere in between minus lambda and lambda. And the ones that achieve the biggest possible absolute value, just lambda, I'm defining that as s. So that's also a unique set because x beta and s were unique. And we can note that this actually contains the support of the solution beta. This set s contains the support of the solution beta. Why? It's because if i is not an s, then that implies that, um, or let's say j is not an s, that xj transpose <coughs> grad uh, f at x beta is strictly in between minus lambda and lambda by definition, which in turn implies that um, sj has to be equal to 0 by definition of the subgradient, right? Because this has to be equal to the subgradient. If the subgradient, wait, I'm sorry, that was the wrong statement. This is what I meant to say. The subgradient must have been in between minus 1 and 1, because this is just lambda times the subgradient. And this is the conclusion, beta j must be 0. The subgradient's ever in between minus 1 and 1, then the subgradient must be 0. Uh, then the the subgradients ever in between minus 1 and 1, the solution must be 0 on that component. That's just the relationship of the subgradient of the L1 norm to, to beta. So this set S, the set of all variables that achieve the biggest correlation with the gradient, this contains the support of the solution, whatever it's going to end up being. OK, so um, let's assume first that if I look at x sub s, which is the columns of my matrix S, that are indexed by these um, maximally correlated uh, variables, that this, ha this is rank deficient. So let's assume this is true for now, which means, as I wrote in the slides, that its rank is less than, strictly less than its number of columns. So it's less than the size of S. Then by definition of what it means for a matrix to be rank deficient, for its columns to rank deficient, I can take one of its columns and write it as a linear combination of the other columns, where all these weights are not zero. So I could, for some i, I can write it as a linear combination of all the other columns. So sum over j of, um, in the set s minus i of cj xj for some constants cj. That's just the definition of rank deficiency of the columns. And it helps to multiply actually both sides by si. So I'm just saying si xi equals the sum of si times cj times xj. And then I've just done something which looks kind of silly, perhaps. I've multiplied, it, I've multiplied twice by, by sj. Okay, Because sj, for all these variables, sj is just going to be minus 1 or 1. So sj squared is 1. So this is also an equivalent condition for uh, x to be ranked, xs to be rank deficient. Why did I write it this way? Now I can take an inner product of both sides with a negative gradient. Take an inner product of both sides with a negative gradient, and I go back to this KKT condition. I can write out the KKT condition. It says that xj transpose the negative gradient is going to be equal to lambda times sj for all j. That's the, um, the KKT conditions. And I've just applied that fact here. And when I take a, um, an inner product 
for, with any variable that's in the set s, by construction, I just get lambda, because S, sj is, is going to be equal to um, minus 1 or 1. And I'm also multiplying, you can see here, by the, the corresponding sign. So the inner product of this with the negative gradient is lambda. The inner product of each of these guys with the negative gradient is also lambda. So I've just concluded that lambda is equal to the sum of si, sj, cj times lambda. And if I divide by lambda, I get that the sum of S, si, sj, cj is 1. So that was actually a very important conclusion. I've just concluded something about the, um, I've concluded something about the, these coefficients that I got the linear combination from. And the conclusion is that actually uh, x, s i of x i is what we call an affine combination of s j x j um, for all j that are in s but that aren't i. So it's a pretty special linear combination. It's an affine combination. Which means if I were to take the affine span of these points, it's going to contain this point, si, xi. And that actually um, pretty much completes the proof. I'm going to have to end because we're out of time. I guess we can continue this in detail next time, but I'll just tell you why it completes the proof. It's because what we've shown is that um, if xs is ever rank deficient, then we must have si, xi being a, a, an exact affine combination of other variables. And you can guess that that happens pretty infrequently if my variables are continuously distributed. Right? If I have x1 and x2, and I take their affine span, which is like, say, this plane, the probability that a third x variable, which is if it has a continuous distribution that has a density, is going to lie exactly in this affine span, is going to be 0. So it's probability 1. This can't happen for continuously distributed variables, which means that I couldn't have had xs being rank deficient. That just couldn't have been true, because it would have implied this. And that's enough to show the solution is unique. Okay, that part, I guess, we can go through next time uh, if there's interest. Okay. All right. Um, see you guys on Tuesday. <laughs>